Hello, this is Martin Patella for Life Enthusiast Podcast. And today I have with me Jake Steiner. He is a hobbyist and an enthusiast and an aficionado of eyesight. Jake shares with me that he does not have to make a living telling people what he's going to be telling us today, which is fantastic because there's no money interest. He can actually tell you the truth because he doesn't care. Jake Steiner. Thank you for that introduction, Martin. Nice to meet everyone. Yeah. Well, yeah, the Life Enthusiast Village, there's quite a few of us. We have a 20-year history and tens of thousands of people who have come by here. We've had listeners for from 190 out of the 195 countries. And um, nice. we're good. So today being a um, day of uh, explaining what we can do with eyesight, uh, I, uh, this is for people who are willing to explore seeing better, right? That's correct. It's um, it, the, the very, very short version is if you wear glasses, if your vision isn't perfect, if you have kids whose vision is compromised, ignoring your eyesight is an amazing fallacy that I'm observing humans are going through because there's no pain associated with it, right? Like, so you try to eat better and you try to be in better shape and you try to lose weight and you try to exercise. But as long as there's a quick fix, a thing you can stick in front of your eyes to in the morning to see better, you ignore it. And it is so integral to your entire well being, and it's so entirely fixable. But people just trust the optometrist saying you have a genetic defect. And so you have to wear these things in front of your face. And I'm basically here to say that that is not true. That is a big, bold, ballsy statement. I like that. <laughs> well, and, and you said I'm an enthusiast and I've been doing this also for just about 20 years. And we have the largest online community of people dealing with eyesight. The website had like 1.2 million regular visitors this year. It, it is a big community of people that have realized this. And I grew up with glasses, right? Like in my early teens, I, I got glasses. It began a real shift in who I was in hindsight. Like I, I stopped playing team sports. I became afraid of the ball, right? Like, so soccer or basketball, whatever the sport became. What was your vision me. specifically? Uh, just short-sightedness. Like yeah. most kids, like how, you know, how, just. How many diopters? Minus five, ultimately. So you couldn't see really much at all without the glasses on, right? Nothing. I couldn't find my glasses without them. Ultimately, right? Like it started as minus one, minus 1 1.5, and just every year it went up a little bit. Right. I know a lot of people who are like that. And uh, it's awesome that, I mean, looking at you, right? Like this is straight, no operation, no, nothing other than the process that you're about to describe. And you're where you are now, right? Yeah, absolutely. I don't need glasses. Nobody needs glasses. Absolutely nobody needs glasses. The, okay, I'm uh, taking these off. You, you, okay, that's a slightly <laughs> different thing. I mean, for short-sightedness, if you started wearing glasses in your teens, you weren't born needing glasses, but at some point you started wearing glasses, there is no defect, right? Like it started as one issue that was environmental and then it became a problem because of the lens treatment. It's a hundred billion dollar a year industry selling you the subscription to lenses. So they right. have a huge interest in not letting yeah. Yeah, let's, basic biology out. Yeah, let's unpack it in just a moment. I just want to explain to people what this is for and what this is not for, just in case uh, they want to bail early. So we have myopia, which is short-sightedness, people who can see up close but cannot see further away. Correct, yes. We have hyperopia, which is people who cannot see up close, but can see far away sharply. Yeah, correct. And then we have presbyopia, which I have, which is I can't focus up close without glasses because I'm too mature. <laughs> yes, that's also great. And uh, what else do we have? Oh, we have astigmatism. We have astigmatism, yes. So 
which is myopia on a specific axis. So right. if you don't wear astigmatism correction, you get like a ghosting or double vision effect. Yeah. So what the, the method that you're about to talk about, are any of these excluded that, that you, it wouldn't apply to? It, I talk specifically about myopia. So if you take your glasses off, you can't see clearly far away. Hyperopia, similar story, the, the same piece of the vision biology applies. Presbyopia is a little bit of a different thing. We, we can chat about it. Um, glasses can maybe be preventable there, but it is a different, different cause. Well, I've been fighting and exercising my eyeballs as much as I can. And I, but I, I need some magnification to see up close. Like when I'm looking at a computer screen as I'm doing right now, uh, it becomes fuzzy when I take this off. Yeah, the, the lens hardens. So the, the yeah. focusing muscle, the ciliary muscle can't shape the lens as much so you don't get as good of a close-up vision. That's, that is a fact of increasing maturity. All right, so especially people who have myopia or astigmatism, let's make sure that they stay on the call and listen hard. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you, you, you said it beautifully. You said there is a billion something dollar industry. It's a racket. <laughs> hundred billion dollars a oh. year oh. It, and it's a racket because they're charging you what two hundred dollars for lenses you can buy for two dollars and fifty cents exactly that is exactly correct and literally exactly correct like the, i have the wholesale pricing sheets for all kinds of brands what the optometrist pays on the outside i mean if you're getting their super fancy stuff is maybe five dollars their cost those would be the high index super light uh, lenses yeah, with all the coatings and everything else and the brand name it's still just single digit dollars so when they're crying to you oh well i can give you 10 percent off then <laughs> they have overhead right like whatever the shop costs whatever employees cost and insurance and everything else certainly there's cost but it's not the clear curve piece of plastic that they're calling prescriptions Right. Yeah, we don't want to deny their livelihood to professionals who provide valuable service. And I suppose an optom optometrist or maybe ophthalmologist would be useful to help you deal with more complicated things like detached retina or, or something complicated like that, right? Absolutely. If there's an Western medicine is really good at acute problems, right? Like if blood is gushing out of your body, if your retina is detaching, fantastic solutions. It's the long-term, there's a thing going on that is not killing you at the moment that there's a symptom treatment for where they can just address the symptom, they're not as great as that. And in general, an optometrist can absolutely help you. Like what we're going to talk about, there are helpful, friendly optometrists that give you glasses that are useful for you. That's perfectly fine. My, my concern is when you walk in there and you go, what's wrong with me? And they say, oh, it's something genetic nothing can be done about it, buy these glasses, wear them all the time. That's what I'm fighting against because it's, it's somewhere between a lie and just ignorance. Yeah, well, you know, for, to a guy on who, who's not knowing something, his livelihood depends, he'll fight hard to not know it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And when, when we were smaller many years ago, I got a lot of pushback and now they're just quiet and ignore us. All right. But, yeah. So we're actually developing a larger problem because we are switching to a society that's got a lot of small screens that people stare at from early on, right? Like a hunter gatherer would have his eyeballs exercised by switching from up close to far and, and scanning objects near far and far, far. And and that's not happening here, right? Like we spend, what, half of our time staring at a little screen? Possibly more. Kids now are incredibly addicted to these things. Just all the stories I hear from parents in schools and kids hiding phones and sneaking phones and just the, the distance, right? Like the smaller the screen, the closer you're going to hold it to have an immersive experience. And just really briefly, the way the biology works, there's a lens in the front of your eyeball 
and there's the retina that receives the light signal and starts processing it in the back. Yeah, so the lens in the front and the retina in the back and the lens's job is to focus the light on the retina in the back. And the lens is flexible, like it, it shapes itself. And the way it's shaped is a circular muscle around that lens. And the closer you look at something, the tighter that it's called the ciliary muscle. So it yes. has to go from flat to steeper and steeper and steeper, right? Yeah, correct. And by design, of course, it's intended to be flat most of the time, right? The muscle is relaxed. And then you look at something closer and the, at six meters, it's still completely relaxed. And then the closer you get, the tighter the muscle gets. Doesn't have a feedback mechanism, right? As far as, as, far as pain goes. So it doesn't tell you when it, when it's tight for too long or when you're over stimulating mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. this extended, extended close distance causes the muscle to spasm eventually. Right. This, so when this you look reminds, at, this, sorry, I keep interrupting, but oh, this reminds me of uh, me being asked to stand on my tippy toes for an hour or two, right? There comes a time when I start shaking uncontrollably because the muscle goes into a cramp. Yeah, and that's exactly what happens. That's that muscle just doesn't fully relax if you do this for many hours at a time. And then what happens is it keeps the lens stuck in some level of close-up mode. So when you look at a distance, you don't get clear distance vision, but not because of a genetic defect, but just that muscle is stuck. And by the way, I have a big challenge with all the stuff on the internet proclaiming all kinds of things, especially when it comes to health. Scholar.google.com is my favorite research website. Um, pseudomyopia and NITM, near-induced transient myopia, are the two terms to type into Google Scholar. Tens of thousands of clinical research references there showing clearly that science knows that this focusing muscle spasm is the beginning of myopia. So mm -hmm. when you go to the optometrist, especially with a kid, and the optometrist says very mild myopia, just started, blah, and you ask, what is it? And they say it's genetic. It's not. It's called pseudomyopia, mm -hmm. completely clearly explained by clinical science. Okay. Not a question mark. Right? So I guess the progression, as you outlined, uh, that they start you off with 1.0, and next year you get 1.5, and then, then you... And so on. How how is that? Is it because the cramp or the the contraction is just simply getting worse as time goes? No, this is really interesting actually, and called lens induced myopia. And I point this out because I want to, when somebody goes, it sounds too much like a conspiracy, right? Like how am I saying that every optometrist is lying to you? That sounds incredibly far fetched. So if you go to Google Scholar and you see tens of thousands of references to pseudomyopia, you realize there is not an unknown genetic defect, right? Like it's really important to be able to make the distinction of, it's not just a guy on the internet saying they're lying, right. it's well known. So then the second part that happens is when they give you lenses, the lens moves the light further back in your eye. So it compensates for the muscle spasm. So the lens basically hides the true problem which is the muscle spasm and just moves the light further back. Mm -hmm. Your eye is a second mechanism for focus. And that is the length of the eyeball. They call it the axial length. It continually adjusts. And there's a, there's a, there's a complex mechanism in the eyeball that is, gives it a self-reference. That's between the rods and cones and the way you perceive green light and red light continues changing the shape of the eyeball to calibrate it. Right? Because the eyeball is never perfect. It's a liquid filled sack, basically. So it always needs to adjust itself. That adjustment, when you put a lens in front of it, the lens causes something called hyperopic to focus where, the, where some of the light focuses behind the retina. And that exact mechanism tells the eyeball, I'm the wrong length. So the, the lens is creating a signal that says I'm too short. So then the eyeball elongates relatively slowly. So it takes about a year for it to go a third of a millimeter and a third of a millimeter is about one diopter. So in a normal case, if you're wearing your glasses all the time, you're wearing them a lot, every year you might get as much as a diopter increase just because a perfectly healthy eyeball is adjusting to this stimulus from the lens. And that's how the optometrist gets the recurring subscription revenue of 
you buying stronger and stronger glasses. All right. So the antidote is that you will wear glasses that are just a little too weak for you today so that your eye will have to try and chase it backwards into the better territory. That is the, there's, you need to, that's exactly correct with the minor detail that you need two pairs of glasses, depending on how strong the glasses are. If you can't see a computer screen without glasses, you need a pair of glasses that are just strong enough for the computer screen. Right. The way your eyesight got worse in the first place, mainly is not from wearing the glasses for distance vision, but when you wear them for close up. So the glasses intended for distance vision, you look at the screen that hyperopic to focus becomes more noticeable to your eye. And that's mainly what causes your eye to get worse. So if you wear glasses that are just strong enough for the computer, always, right? Never wear the distance glasses. And then for distance wear glasses that instead of giving you 2015 perfect vision, give you 2030, right? And you, you challenge your eyesight very, very slightly. Not, okay. not throwing away your glasses, not doing anything extreme, just basically mm. what you're saying is you're slowly walking backwards those diopters. All right. So I guess it's still safe to drive with a 2030 vision, right? That's legal. Um, yes. I'm not giving any advice on that front where somebody's going to have a car accident. In, in the U.S., for example, in, in most states, 2040 is the legal limit per the DMV. So 2030 is legal. It's when it comes to driving, I always say wear whatever it is that gives you the clearest vision because nighttime, right? Your vision may be less, less fantastic if it's raining at speed, your acuity is different than static acuity. So for me, driving is that exception where I always say, keep your old pair of glasses in the car. If you feel that you need them, be sure to be safe. Okay. Right? But if you're walking, if you're out and about in a, in a, in an environment where you're not relying on perfect eyesight and especially in the beginning when you're still figuring this out is just having both pair right like having the pair that the optometrist gave you and having a slight reduction mm -hmm. to get you into that space where it's like okay this challenges me a little bit and what and, would and getting familiar a, with it sorry and what would you call a slight direction uh, difference or slight reduction like uh, it, between a four and, I, and five kind of thing at the very, it depends, right? If you got in, if you haven't gotten new glasses in ten years, then those glasses may already be quote unquote weaker because your eyeball may have adjusted in length. If they're recent glasses that you've got from the optometrist, it's very likely that you're overcorrected by as much as a diopter. Um, what I found is people that start this in the first ninety days make about a diopter reduction, which is not just the eye improving, but just your you're learning how to challenge your eyesight and you're realizing that what the optometrist gave you was stronger than you really use for acuity in your day-to-day -day life. Okay. So yeah, but, but that first reduction, uh, you know, if you just reduce it by half diopter, just because it's an experiment and you don't want to, because you're introducing more blur, right? So if you're just introducing a little bit of blur, that's also perfectly fine. Like there's no need, because people tend to go overboard. Like the first thing people do is they find out about this as did I, and then just make too big of a reduction. And now you can't recognize facial expressions, little details, people across the street. And then it's then your quality suffering. of life. Yeah. Yeah. That that's okay. Got it. Don't, don't try to break the world record in the quickest recovery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And right. it takes, speaking of it, the average rate of improvement, and this is, talking about tens of thousands of people for the last 20 years is about just a little bit under adopt a year. So three to four months, you can make a quote adopt a reduction on average, right? In the beginning, it's faster, but after that, that's about average. So it's unlikely that you can just throw away your glasses in a month or six months or whatever internet claims are about. It's a very gradual, your eyeball readjusts itself progress. Okay. So, of course, that's going to get costly if we don't have friends in the right places. If you're not getting wholesale $2 prices for lenses. So how do you do that? Or do you share that with people on the forum? How do you, how do you help people with this? Uh, buy glasses online. It, there's a bazillion lens shops. Um, like in the U.S., a lot of people use a place called Zenny for $20, you're getting things that the optometrist charges $200 for. 
So it's still not, I wouldn't call it cheap, but it's in an affordable range. Me sure. personally, I've always, uh, my thing is always bring up in coffee and donuts to a susceptible optometrist shop in the late morning and work out a deal, right? Like if you find somebody who's supportive, it depends on the country. It depends on the individual. I always say, Hey, glasses give me a headache. When I work on the computer will give me lower ones. That's kind of my fishing question. If they say, yeah, sure. Then that's my shop. And then uh, realizing the overhead, realizing the cost, I've always made some kind of agreement and that's worked for me. But now I started this 20 years ago and now a lot of people just buy online 15, 20, $25. Okay. The good so for three have, or four months. So you have like three pairs, three pairs of glasses or something like that. And you just alternate by situation. Yeah. And you just every three to three to four months, you're stepping it down a little bit. Okay. Okay. So what is a person that has a different eyes right like one is a two and the other one is a three what do they do and this is why the simple idea starts getting a little bit more involved like the website has like 1200 somewhat articles i've written over the years where there's so many little detail scenarios like well, what i refer to as diopter ratio when you're one eye is stronger than the other and that starts with something called ocular dominance Everybody has a stronger eye and a weak eye, quote unquote. It's just part of how your visual system handles focusing and movement and 3D space. So your, your eyes don't see exactly the same. But when you go to the optometrist, they correct your vision like one eye is weaker, where it's just naturally that way. So they introduce this ratio change that over time can grow larger, depending on who the optometrist is and depending on how you answer sitting in a dark room is this better is this better slowly over time increases so little details there and there's a million of them of the first reduction just ignore that that difference and just reduce both sides the same so if you're minus three and minus four right you go down to a minus 2.5 and minus 3.5 keep that difference so you're not introducing a change in how you see your environment by keeping it as simple as possible. And when your eyes adjust to that, and then you can see as well as you could before, eventually you just go a quarter diopter lower in the stronger side. And then it takes a little bit longer to adjust to that. But eventually you can get rid of this ratio the same way that it was created in the first place, just by very slowly reducing it over time. Okay. So that, slowly. Mm, is the astigmatism problem similar to this? Or is that a more complicated thing? It's very similar. Um, it, real astigmatism exists. Like if your corneal surface is uneven to a degree that your visual cortex can't compensate for it, it's exceedingly rare. The problem is when you're sitting in a dark room at the optometrist shop, they introduce cylinder correction that fixes astigmatism. And if in that moment you don't say, no, that's not better, they might leave it on. And there you go, you have astigmatism. And eventually your eye adopts to this and now you you need it right but you can reduce it and again here why the website is so extensive is you reduce it for your your close-up first you don't use astigmatism correction at uh, three meter or less distance or a lot less right so uh, a ghosting or double vision from astigmatism that's noticeable at a distance may not be noticeable when you're reading a book Right. So you reduce the astigmatism for close up first. And when you find that any small amount of ghosting is gone, then you introduce that reduction for distance. And it takes longer, right? Like an astigmatism reduction may take you six months instead of three, but it goes away the same way as spherical myopia does. Okay. So your, your <laughs> eyes are fine, right? Like your <laughs> eyes are fine. They're doing the job if you let them. I mean, I know people who complain of headaches in front of screens and uh, and this double vision and uh, they they get the correction and they they feel better or they don't get the the visual stress that that they would have right absolutely and 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 for sure there are situations where you need correction for your eyesight it is just a lot less common than what we're being sold all right. Like I had astigmatism, I had over a diopter of astigmatism. I don't have it now. 
and I collect success stories and we have a Facebook group that's fairly large now and I do a little podcast. Very commonly people have a stigmatism around adopter or so that, that eventually is just gone. Right? Like it's, it's very, very uncommon. It happens, especially if you have no spherical myopia or very, very low, like in the one doctor range, but you have a bunch of astigmatism. Like, like you have two plus doctors of astigmatism, there's maybe something going on. And then in those cases, like people have gone to the ophthalmologist and they get something called a corneal topography that checks your cornea where there is an actual issue. And yes, you need glasses for it, but it's just, that's very uncommon. Right? Not as common. Okay. The, yeah. So we should read out the, uh, the, your website's name and the Facebook group. How, is it a public group or do people need to apply and be approved? A, you, people need to be applied and approved. And when it was created, I didn't know better. I made it that way. And now Facebook doesn't let me change it. So even we have 18,000 some odd members, it is it requires approval to get in. We also have a forum that doesn't. So I, I like the forum better, but there's Facebook group and the YouTube channel and the website is end myopia.org and it has all the links to all the community stuff as well great well this sounds very hopeful like and, and and i want to point out because one issue that people have is lacking the motivation to do anything about it because you can't throw in the contact lenses you can't put on the glasses we don't realize how much it's empowering and how much it improves your quality of life to not be dependent on these things, right? Like I used to think that I can't do sports, right? I paraglide and kite surf now because I found that my motor control skills are better than I thought because I have good peripheral vision that you don't have with glasses, right? Like I, th there's so many nuances. I thought I was a huge introvert and that, I don't like talking to people, but it was just my, the way you move your eyes instead of moving your neck when you wear glasses makes you seem somewhat antisocial, right? Like when you walk, you look at the ground because you don't have peripheral vision. So your physical expression of yourself is significantly different as a lens wear and the way people perceive you and the way you end up perceiving yourself and how you interact with the world is it's very much affected by your lens wear. So even though it seems like not a big deal, you just throw those things on and it's one less problem to have to fix. It is completely worth to go understanding doctors, understanding your eyesight, and at least just taking a little step in the direction of maybe I'll explore this. I just want to put that out there because what we talk about, of course, is interesting, but the motivation for a lot of people doesn't come till they realize, hey, my life could be noticeably better if I wasn't stuck behind these. Yeah, this is important. The why, why am I wanting to do this, right? Why am I wanting to spend the, whatever it's going to take on the extra frames and lenses. And yeah. the end goal is you're going to be as humans we're supposed to be. We didn't evolve wearing eyewear on the savanna in Africa, right? Yeah. And it's posture, the way people sit in front of a computer, because with lenses, especially, oh, yeah. we develop yeah, this the, dependency. The you start like lean. Yeah, all of like a lot of posture problems. Like people try to correct their posture, they do yoga, but then they wear glasses, which which limit your ability to fix posture things, right? Like, so there's so many. I could talk for an hour about how lenses affect your whole interaction with the world and yourself. Um, so the the why definitely is a is a big one. All right. right. So, so the expected trajectory is that you're going to be able to push back about a diopter a year. So for most people, that could be uh, only a three or four year process to go lens free, right? Yes. And also, and that's another, right? so many topics. It, it's not just about how this takes too long, right? People tell me like, oh, this is going to take five years. Not worth it. But every diopter is a completely different experience. Because if you look through your glasses, if you take your glasses off and you move them in front of your face, you start seeing how poor the optical quality is that you receive through lenses. Like it's the, there's, you start seeing these steps and color changes and everything is a lot smaller through the lenses, right? Than it is in real life. So if you go from a minus five to a minus three, 
you have you see literally a larger world right and you have less distortion you see better colors you can put your glasses down and find them again so i say celebrate every diopter because every diopter gives you literally better vision even through the lenses right so i, I always like to think of it as every year is a significant change not just the end goal of 2020. right on well, I find that nutrition has a lot to do with it. Like I, I know that if I don't eat as well as I could, my vision is worse. I notice yeah. that my ability to focus improves with being less tired, but being less affected by food. And uh, I don't know, I could get into the weeds on that. Do, do you have some comments on that? I do. I do. Insulin spikes very bad for your, for your eyesight. Um, so you might notice if you if you drink a large Coke and have a pizza afterwards, you might notice that your focus isn't as good. Uh, insulin spikes are not great. A lot of people report, and I'm not a nutrition food expert, but a lot of people report intermittent fasting helps the eyesight. And I mean a lot of people. These are still anecdotes, right? Because it's just people telling me stuff. But it's a lot of people who say, hey, when I fixed what I eat, less processed food, less sugar, right? Like generally better diet. Fasting really seems to make a difference, helps eyesight. It doesn't address the lenses, right? Like the, the core issue is the lenses and reducing the opters, but absolutely diet plays a role, diet and light. You know, as a health coach, of course, I could tell you that the eyes reflect the quality of how your liver is operating and your liver is affected by the food you feed yourself, because if you make your liver more toxic, then you're going to have a lesser operating capacity at your eyeballs. No question there. So as, as just as you mentioned, the high carbohydrate diet will do it. And then also the, uh, the fasting is great because it gives your body a chance to detoxify itself. That's, that's the main purpose of it. Yeah, and, and people forget about light. Um, the weird narrow UV spectrum indoor lighting that we use affects your eyesight noticeably as well. By the way, these things are all easily measurable because a diopter is just distance to blur, right? Like how many centimeters can I see before there's blur equals a diopter number. So you can take a measuring tape. We now have an iPhone app that can also measure your, your myopia. Well, that's Still, cool. Yeah, not perfect yet, but measuring your distance to blur. How many centimeters can I see before blur starts? If you do that in shaded natural light, the distance is going to be noticeably greater than if you do it in some weird LED or fluorescent lit indoor room that appears to be as bright. So the UV spectrum, and not UV spectrum, but the spectrum of light affects how far you can see clearly and eye strain. Right? So, so food and lighting are the other two big pieces that, mm -hmm. that we ignore a lot. Yeah, we actually have several products that help people with their vision. I have, you know, we have, we have something that helps to detox the eyes. Fulvic okay. acid, that, and the, uh, you know, we call it the bright eye. And it's a product that, that many people have bought on our website and it's, it helps them immensely because it helps to detoxify the eyeball, especially from floaters and, and other oxidative stress stuff. Floaters come up a lot and that's your area more than my area. So, I mean, in the Facebook group, it just the floaters question every few days, somebody asks about floaters and that's, oh, I, I just keep saying, yeah, we'll have to, I don't know we'll if have I should to dare to come on your group and peddle my wares. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't don't mind that at all. Happy to try it, right? Because we have a fairly large group. If people bring up floaters, I'm more than happy to recommend they try that and see see what it does. Okay. There's no peddling wares. Well, you know, so open. We have to try things, right? Like if you say it works, I am more than happy to to, to tell people that you said and they should try it out. Yeah. I, I started a Facebook group too. This time, this was for people with fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. thinking that they needed a lot of help and I knew how to help them. But when I started telling them what would work, they, uh, most of them were very hostile in that, that I am actually peddling my wares. I am trying to take advantage of them. 
it, even though I was not forcing anybody's hand, like I was just saying, well, look, you know, try this. If you like it, tell others. But they wouldn't try it. They would just scream saying, you want to uh, sell us stuff. It's, and this is why I mentioned Google Scholar with stuff for people to do research because it's really difficult. I, I appreciate people's position, right? Because there's so much stuff on the internet where somebody's just using something to sell whatever product it is. So it's really hard for people to make that distinction. Like I appreciate where they're coming from at the same time it sucks because sometime during the year I sell courses, not very actively and they're not like right now there aren't any, but whenever I do, there's people go, oh, you're just trying to make money. And I understand where they're coming from. You know what I mean? Like I, it's never out of, out of nothing, out of the blue. But at the same time, I say, right, like we have to be open-minded and recognize that some people are trying to help you, right? And that we can't just put everybody in the same box of you're just peddling wares. Okay. Try it out. Because if I can get, re if I can answer that floaters questions with something, I'd be absolutely happy about that. Yeah. Yeah, and so, well, okay, awesome. And the other question we know how to answer is that when you have red eyes, when you have uh, overtired red eyes, we have something that will bring oxygen in and soothe them. Okay, bring it, bring it on. Happy to share. Sure. And the funny part is that it's not crazy priced. Oh, well, that's you. So, better. good. We'll, awesome. we'll help your people too. Um. So what did I not ask? What what did I miss that that you should be saying? It's just it's a long topic. I think we there's a good introduction, maybe especially the why part and the way to research whether it's true and that you're not genetically defective. Kids, kids is a big thing. Maybe um, iPads are not babysitters, and your kids might be incredibly addicted to those screens and. And, and you might be setting a bad example by also using screens too much. So like recognizing the addiction to the screen and not blaming yourself, but just going, what else can I do with my life that doesn't involve scrolling through a Facebook feed is, is maybe on the side worth considering. So the antidote to that is really getting away from the screen, right? A hundred percent. And that's a different topic. That's not me, but I get so much email from parents that I wasn't getting 10 years ago. That all boils down to parents figured out that an iPad is a babysitter, right? And when you put an iPad in front of a two-year-old, by the time the two-year-old is three, can't see perfectly, goes to the optometrist, gets glasses at four or five and young kids with glasses, the eyeball elongation happens very quickly. So it can be a dramatic thing and it, it will affect the child's quality of life significantly. And I always say at this, if a child is holding a screen, that, that is a no, no, you might as well just give them coffee and vodka at that point. So the gifts that a parent can give to the child, because this is a big gift, right? The gift of uncorrected vision is, um, it's a life, lifelong gift. Or, or the other way is if you allow it to go sideways, you're actually stealing from your children the future that they might have had. Yeah. I have a five-year-old and one of the first words he learned was scooch back. It's funny and terrible, but because we let him watch movies, but the distance is key, right? Like six meters, your, your ciliary muscle is relaxed. He was never allowed to hold a phone. People give him a phone. I shout at the people. Oh, like, so... Just, Sorry, so to, to have a large enough screen, yeah, uh, that's far, far, do, do far I need six to... meters, whole six meters? Yeah, ideally, ideally, that's 20 I mean, feet. A... Yeah, that's across that a large room, yeah, ideally, but okay, fine, watch TV, but no handheld. A kid holding a device is, is a no no, all right, like for, for school, it's necessary, blah, etc. The distance is super key, but for entertainment. And that's again, like now we're getting into the weeds because that's not really my area. But if your child has vision problems and your child gets to hold and play with an iPad, that's why, right? And it's gonna get a lot worse if the child gets glasses. Well, it's important. I, I was not long ago was reading my father's bio that he wrote. He's, he's not, no longer alive. 
and and I'm reading his bio that he wrote and saved for whoever wants to read it. And there he's talking about how at age 14 or 15, he had to give up hockey that he loved because his vision wasn't up to it and the glasses that there was no peripheral vision. And uh, so the, the thing that was left for him was running. So he became a sprinter because he was into sports, but he had to give up steam sports. Yeah, I played water polo. I loved water polo and I, I got glasses and they got stronger and stronger to the point where the ball was just a yellow blur. And I taught myself how to catch the center of the yellow blur. And then it got to the point where I couldn't recognize teammates. And it was, that was the end of it. This is why I'm doing this because it's, it diminishes your quality of life and the, it's a genetic defect is a lie. All right. And we just need at least the choice. We need to be given the choice to go, do I take the quick fix or not? All right. Because what happened to your dad happened to me, happens to millions of people that are just not aware there's another option. This is a big deal. And I especially see this thing with the parent and the child. I would really like to put in the guilt message for all parents who are watching this. Don't steal your children's future by letting yeah. them become myopic. And you know, in the 16th century, this problem existed and it was just monks because nobody else was reading. It was just monks and candles and, and books, right? Mm -hmm. Johannes Kepler already said 16th century that that myopia comes from I'm staring at this close-up thing for too long it's already figured out and then it became us in our teens because then we didn't have screens we just had books now there's screens now instead of 12 and 15 it's five right because now this this screen thing starts or this close-up starts that much earlier and optometry I, I own stock in lots of lens manufacturing and related industries and I've made a lot of money from it because that is a growing industry. Very unfortunate. Okay. So the website again? Endmyopia.org. What a wonderful name. End myopia. You know, I figured out years and years and years into this that people don't know what myopia is. It's not till we started doing podcasts and people said, what is myopia? That I figured out my marketing is terrible. Well, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, it works. See, see me clearly. Yeah. Dot com. <laughs> yeah, it's fine now. And it's begun big enough where people just figured it out. Right on. Yeah, yeah I'm, you know, Facebook group with eighteen thousand people. That's that's no mean feat. That's that's a significant movement. Yeah, yeah, and we don't promote it or anything, so it's it's cool. All right. Jake Steiner and myopia.org. People, you can see better than this. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Martin, for having me on. I really appreciate it. This is Life Enthusiast, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. We stay to the mission. www.life-enthusiast.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>